Yeah, he's already hitting something that's very skeptical. Yeah. Yeah. Ayam Nija Parovedi Ganana Lagu Chetasam Udara Charitanam to Vasudeva Kutumuka. Good afternoon and Namaste to Sister Shivani, Sister Jayanti, Mr. Aurora, and all our esteemed guests. Welcome to the second edition of the UK India Youth Leadership Conclave organized by the National Indian Students and Alumni Union. My name is Sadam Natrajan and I'm the head of youth affairs at MISO UK. Professionally, I'm an ethics and risk management consultant and I work on a voluntary basis with Grisu, as well as do volunteering activities with other charities. Founded in 2012, NISU is the apex organization representing students, alumni, and young professionals of Indian origin in the UK. We are an umbrella organization for India and India-related student societies in the UK, and aim to bring a unified voice of India's diaspora youth. We collaborate with many governmental and non-governmental organizations in India and the UK to promote Indian culture and further the UK-India relationship by nurturing a dynamic ecosystem of young leaders. NISO is usually the first word of call for individual support and grievance redressal, and we have often helped out Indian students in the cases of lost passports and sometimes, unfortunately, rape victims as well. We also connect with professionals of Indian origin in the UK and enable them to share ideas and skills amongst each other as well as the student community. We proactively engage with the India and India focused student societies on one national platform to facilitate exchange of ideas and cultures and this is a model we aspire to scale and implement at a global level. We are very proud that we are supported by our patrons which include Mr. Virendra Sherma, Lord Bill Moria and Shashi Karu. Our honorary fellows include Ms. Shivana Azmi, Mr. Javed Akta, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, and Baba Ram Dev. Diversity and inclusion are fundamental to our core values. We respect and work with people of all religions, all backgrounds, all genders, and strive towards building an even more inclusive society. Just like last year, we are hosting this conclave to mark the occasion of International Yoga Day. Whilst yoga helps with our physical well-being, spirituality can often positively influence your mental well-being. To kick off this meeting, I'd like to invite Mr. Gopal Mohan. Uh, he's an advisor to the Chief Minister of Delhi, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal, and he's the brain behind many successful policies implemented in Delhi, including the doorstep Delhi resources. Mr. Mohan, can I give the mic to you? Uh, welcome, ma'am. आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत है। अम्म M I S A U आप सब बहुत अच्छे से वाक्य फॉर्मे। इंट्रोडक्शन में भी आपने सुना कि इंडियंस को यहाँ पे हेल्प करना एक अलग देश में आप लोग आते हैं और यहाँ पे जो प्रॉब्लम्स आप लोग फेस करते हैं उसके लिए आपके पास कोई प्लेटफॉर्म नहीं था। तो आपने और आपने और जो आपकी टीम है उन्होंने इतना अच्छा काम किया कि आपको कांग्रेट्यूशंस और इनकी वजह से आज बहुत सारे लोग जो किसी प्रॉब्लम में फंस जाते हैं या कुछ भी होता है तो उनको आज हेल्प मिल रही है इनकी वजह से थैंक्स थैंक्स अलॉट फॉर आर सिटिजेंस अनदर जो आज के टॉपिक a country, you know all the problems which we are facing in our country. So, I want to say one line only, that if our youth is on track, our country will grow exponentially. If the youth is not on track, it will be a failure, big failure. So, whatever suggestions you want to give, uh, I will definitely communicate your all suggestions to my Chief Minister and will try to follow all your suggestions or which we can do. So you are open to give us suggestions or anything and uh, I will request ma'am also to tell us something which help us in 
make our country future brighter. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Mohan. Very kind of you. Thank you. Mr. Sharma, Mr. Virinder Sharma, one of our patrons, unfortunately couldn't make it today. He was meant to be here. Uh, he sends his apologies. There's some last minute change in the plans. Uh, I would like to move on to the next section where uh, I'd like to introduce Sister Jayanti from the Brahma Kumaris to talk about the idea behind Brahma Kumaris. She is the European Director of Brahma Kumaris with over 40 years of experience of Raja Yoga meditation and its practical application in daily life. Her gentle voice and profound insights on spiritual solutions to everyday problems have touched the hearts, hearts of thousands of people around the world. Sister Jayanti, if you could talk to us a bit. Thank you. Good afternoon and a greeting of peace to all my sisters and brothers. Om Shanti. <laughs> it's a great joy and privilege to be with so many young people. And I know that those who are a little bit older in their bodies are also young at heart. <laughs> so most welcome to all of you also, including myself. <laughs> but I'm happy to see all of you here. The start of the Brahma Kumaris was interesting because it was one individual and so many things start just with one. And this one individual had a vision of a better world. And he reflected on this concept, how is it possible to create a better world? And he understood it was by education, consciousness raising. And he also understood that if you want a world of equality, now I'm talking about 1936 in the province of Sindh, which is today in Pakistan. It was a united India. So think back to the history of that period and you'll begin to see that he was a bit of a revolutionary because he understood that the, the fundamental factor for a better world would be equality and justice. And he looked around and he saw that the biggest injustice and inequality was in the genders. And so he very consciously decided that there would be leadership, training, and spiritual education for everyone. Everyone needs it, but especially for girls and women. And by chance, the group that came together, about 300, included around, I would say 80% were women, 20% were men, but within that, it was a lot of young women who were present. And this program of leadership training, they didn't call it that, but that's what it was, um, began in 1937 for this group. And out of that group of 300, we still have four individuals who are still around with us. And London's been very, very fortunate because the woman who today heads up our organization, spent about 40 years here in London and still visits frequently. She'll be coming again in July, at the end of July. She travels across the globe still, and her age is now 103. <laughs> but she started when she was 21. And others also aged 15, 16. The vision that the leader at that time, we call him Brahma Baba, the father, and I had the good fortune of meeting him several, th several times through my own um, childhood and later on teenage years, and I think it was the inspiration he gave me that at the age of 19 I was able to decide that my life had to be of service to humanity rather than just something for myself alone, and so I would credit that to him definitely. So he, his vision was of um, not just spiritual education, but it was very much that if there was spiritual education, that each one could teach not just one other, but a hundred others. And basically that's what's happened. And so today the Brahma Kumaris, I think in the early 80s, we were the first purely spiritual organization from India that was given general consultative status with the United Nations. And so we continue to work with the UN in all the different areas, youth and women and peace and um, 
environment, that's a big topic today, but we've been doing all of those things. I'll give you one example of how spirituality and external activity work together. We've been involved with climate change for many years, and two years ago, we actually um, commissioned a me one megawatt power station at Abu. And this is something that my dear brother Ashok has seen and witnessed, but it was totally um, built locally, with local people getting training to be able to do all the skilled work and so on. And it really is a revolution in terms of allowing solar energy to be used for not just um, cooking or little things, but totally providing the power, the electricity, for a township where we have our own organization. And if you can imagine 25,000 people being given three meals a day and all the computers that are needed, so all of that happens with solar power. So spirituality is not just sitting in a corner and meditating and looking at your navel, but it's very much aligning yourself with what is the world within you, and then seeing how to apply that alignment and that power that you're generating within into work outside that can benefit the community and the world. So that gives you a little snapshot of the organization. I want to mention one more thing. Um, there's a man called Professor um, Michael Hardy, and he works at Coventry, but he's worked on an international scale in diplomacy and international peace agreements and so on. And he was with us a little while ago, and he shared four aspects of leadership, which I think will interest you. And in our conversation, I said to him, but I think it's impossible to achieve these without spirituality. And he agreed. And so those four principles of leadership that they researched and understood, these are the fundamentals for good leadership. Firstly, if you make a promise, you have to keep it. Otherwise, you destroy people's trust. Secondly, you walk your talk. There can't be leadership without that. Thirdly, interesting, he mentioned it has to be without discrimination. There has to be equal vision for all. And fourthly, benevolence. If you have only your concerns personally, you'll never be a leader. But if you have concern for others and want to allow them to move forward, that makes a leader. And so you can see why my comment was only spirituality can give you the power and the capacity to do these four things. I'm going to leave it to our sister to elaborate further. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insightful talk. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student of ethics, um, as well as that's my job. And, and we were talking about ethics in AI and the four principles that are key in ethics of AI are trust, reliability, empathy, and what was the fourth one? Uh, I'm, I'm struggling to remember that. But yeah. essentially, it completely aligned uh, with, with the kind of values that you talked about. So, so very, very curious. I'm going to read up a bit more about uh, Brahma Kumaris as soon as I go back home. Uh, next, I'm very happy to invite Sister Shivani to present her keynote speech on uh, spirituality, leadership, and global citizenship. Many of you may know Sister Shivani already. She's quite well known in India and amongst the Indian diaspora. Uh, she features in a tele television series called Awakening with the Brahma Kumaris. She, in 2014, she was awarded a Woman of the Decade Award, Achievers Award by the Asacham Ladies League for her excellence in empowering spiritual consciousness. In 2019, she was also honored with the Nari Shakti Award by the President of India at the Rashtrapati Bhavan in New Delhi, India. Sister Shivani, could you share your thoughts, please? Good evening and Om Shanti. At the Brahma Kumaris, our greeting is not high. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we are taught that don't greet each other saying hi, hi. Because hi, hi, Hindi mein kya ho jata hai? <laughs> <laughs> hmm? So, 
because a greeting is very important. It's an affirmation because that's one word we use many, many times in the day. So we learn that instead of saying hi, hi, we should say wow, wow. Hi, hi, bullying it to zindagi, hi, hi, ho chaiki. And wawa bullying it to zindagi, wawa ho chaiki. So every word we use is not just a word, it's an energy which we create, we experience that energy and then we radiate it to others. So the greeting at the Ramakumari is Om Shanti, which means I am a peaceful being. Om is Ahamatma, I the soul, and Shanti is peace. So every time we're saying Om Shanti, it's an affirmation. You know, the world today is talking about the power of affirmations and the power of visualization. And that's something which all leaders use, the power of affirmation and visualization. But if the greeting itself becomes an affirmation, so unaware, we just say it the same line repeatedly many, many times in the day. But only thing to take care of is be it, Feel it, then say it, and radiate it to others. So, Om Shanti. So, at any point of time, if you're a little upset, disturbed, just say Om Shanti to yourself. Which means just remind yourself. It's not a word just to say, but just remind yourself. This is not my nature. I am a peaceful being. Let's take a moment of silence and just ask yourself, not about what we've heard, we've read, but sometimes we have our own understanding of certain words and what it would mean for us. Didi shared four very important principles of leadership. Brother shared three out of four. Fourth one he'll share with us by the end of the evening. <laughs> so, you know, honestly, because this is the irony sometimes, we don't even remember what the points are. And that normally happens. You go to a corporate, there will be a mission statement outside. There's a vision statement. And you go there and you meet the team and say, what's your mission statement? And they will be like, um, um, and they don't remember the mission statement of the organization or the vision, even though they're crossing that board at least 20 times in a day. It's because we don't internalize it. It's the mission of the organization, it's the vision of the institution. But unless that aligns with my personal mission and vision, I'm not able to internalize it. Then sometimes they're just profound words. And that's why Didi said that all these words are not possible unless we have spirituality in our life, which means we are inculcating those value systems and we're living by them. Then we won't even need to remember them. Then we will be we will need to remember those four words. We will be we will be practical embodiment samples of those four words for the world that here is a leader. So let's take a moment of silence. Clean screen of the mind. Just ask yourself what the word leadership means for you. Leadership for me is fill in the blank. where I am, the role I play. Leadership quality. Seeing it in yourself. Choose one quality, which for you is what and who a leader should be. leadership is fill in the blank what's the word for you I think that, I think that 
helping other people, beautiful, so leadership for him is helping other people, very nice, anything else, leadership is, leading by example, perfect, empathy, leadership is empathy, taking people along with you on your journey, journey of, Yeah, taking people along with me on the journey of <coughs> Now I think about it. Taking people along with me on the journey of, of success. Okay, perfect. Journey of success. Anything else, brother? Leadership for you? Hmm? Getting justice. Getting? Justice. Giving justice. Giving justice. Common people. Common people. Acha. So you want to get justice for people. You want to give justice to common people. You want to give justice to people. Okay. Anything else missing? Leadership is? Strength. Strength. What strength? The ability to believe in yourself and others when nobody believes in you. Perfect. The ability to believe in myself and the ability to believe in others when no one is believing in you. Perfect. Empowering others to do their work without any tension, to do this without any fear. Great. So empowering people and bringing out their best without any fear. Anyone else? Being honest. Being honest. Perfect. And the else? Creating a Achieving a, achieving a shared vision. Anyone else? Leadership for me is? Fill in the blank. Selfless service. Replication of best learning. Replication of? Of best learning. Achha, of best learning. Okay. Working for the bigger good. Working for the bigger good. Perseverance. Perseverance. See how many qualities we've got already. Anything else missing? Responsibility. Responsibility. Being strong-minded. Being strong-minded. Sign of a strong-minded person. Strong. Strong. <laughs> yeah, so what's the sign of that? <laughs> strong. Because I need to know whether I'm strong-minded or no. So what's the sign of a strong-minded person? Strong. Brave. Yeah. Brave. Brave. Take risks. Is strong-minded. Okay. Good. Decision maker. Decision maker. Yeah. Anyone else? Anji? Taking tough decisions. Being non-judgmental. Anyone has anything which has been left? Leading others and one's self to happiness. Okay. Being happy, contented and leading others on the same path. Okay. Now let's make a short list of the words we've got. Hmm? Happiness. Selfless service. Empathy, sharing, kindness, strong-minded, helping people, empathize. Anything else we left behind? Responsibility. Responsibility. Empowerment. Empowerment. How many of you feel I have these qualities? To a certain extent, we all have those qualities. Anji, kya I thought you asked me. No, no, no. I mean, no, no. I mean, I have to ask myself. Do I have these qualities? Huh? Yes. But we are all leaders here, and we all have these qualities. But we use those qualities sometimes. Sometimes. And sometimes we shift away from them and use an emotion which is contradictory to that. Leadership means to be able to use that quality, whichever one you select, always and with everyone. Even if it's a simple word like happy, then always, you know, happy, but always and with everyone. Empathize always with everyone, kind to everyone, sharing with 
everyone. And that is the reason what Devi shared was to be able to do this with everyone <coughs> and always, I hear, need to have the power to, need to have the power to give. Otherwise, I'm able to use that quality only when situations and people are favorable for me. Or the day I am in a mood where I'm able to give. Or the day my personal life is going fine, I have the power to give others. But when I'm going through my own issues, or the day I'm not in a very stable mind, my power to empathize, my power to empathize, my power to be kind, my power to help, my power to be compassionate is all. And that is what is going to differentiate, that's going to differentiate who's a leader. So leader is not going to be based on our roles and positions, but leader is going to be based on our quality and our power to be that always. Responsibility, which means the ability to respond right always. Not only when situations are right for me. So leadership, to be able to empathize, to be able to be kind, and all the values we've come out with, in every moment, in every situation of life, I will need to first hear, be very centered, and stable. To be able to empathize with another person, first I need to not get affected by their behaviors. Only then I will be able to accept them as they are, to understand what they are going through. Has anyone of you ever experienced someone who is jealous of you? Who's experienced that? Anyone ever experienced someone who's insecure around you? Now, their behavior may not be very right to you. If I get affected by their behavior, if I question their behavior, right? If I'm hurt by what they are doing or saying about me, then I'm not empathizing. If someone is dominating me, if someone is manipulating with me, if I don't understand the emotion that they are going through, then I will get hurt, upset, feel frustrated, because I don't have the power to empathize, which means to understand what they are going through. So to be able to empathize, the first power that I need is to not get touched or influenced or affected by the emotion of the other person which means not receive their energy, remain stable, understand what they are going through, and then have the power to give them what they need. And there it gives me the opportunity to first empathize, second to be kind, third to be selfless, fourth to share, and fifth to be responsible for my village. Everything will happen. But all that will happen only when first my mind does not get affected by the other person's behavior and gets sucked into that emotion. So leadership will be the one who will be able to be out of the energy field, out of the energy field of the situations and people and be stable even if it's a crisis. Only that soul will have the power to inspire others, lead by example, <coughs> walk the talk, only if I am untouched by the energy of the situations and people and I remain at that my value of kindness, sharing, compassion and empathy. <coughs> In an era where we react, then regret, then create guilt, then want to change. In that era, 
to be able to cultivate the strength to remain stable. Pause, understand and then respond. That's the quality a leader will need. A leader will not react in a situation. That's responsibility. The ability to respond right in every situation. And then to be able to create that quality, we will need to do something for ourselves on a daily basis. How many of you create anger once in a while? Musa? Irritation? Irritation? Now these are some of the emotions which is an absolute no-no for a leader. No, no, for a leader, absolutely. Because a leader is the one who's going to be at a higher vibration and is going to pull everybody else to that higher vibration. Not the one who will get affected by a slightest situation which is not my way and react. The other day I was doing, you were only in London, two days back, I was doing a radio a interview and the lady says, this morning I asked somebody to not forward me particular pictures on social media and she said he blocked me. She said just because I said don't forward, she, he blocked me. So now this is a sign of our, sign of our tolerance level. Now we don't need very big issues to talk about tolerance. <laughs> Earlier tolerance was like big profound issues. We are not even tolerant to people's choices. This is reaction. I need to check what is it that affects me and I react and I lose my leadership quality at that moment. Because leaders means they will be calm, stable, in control of themselves. To be able to lead others, I will need to first take charge of myself even if everything outside has gone wrong. Not just one word or behavior, just everything outside is not right, this leader. This leader will be calm, stable, not blame others for what has happened, not blame others, shift from focusing on the problem to working on the solution, and then remain at that energized vibration and pull everyone to that higher vibration. And now to be able to do this and before we start taking care of others and we start taking care of all the youth from India or from UK and the world, there is one very important person we need to start taking care of. <coughs> Who's that one person? The one little mistake that most of us are making, we are very kind but we want to take care only of others. And we have such a poor intention to take care of others that we say, I have no time to take care of myself. My life is all about taking care of others. And that's where the equation doesn't go right. The World Physician Association changed their oath two years back. The doctor's oath used to all be about selfless service, taking care of people, putting people before yourself and now they've changed the oath and introduced a paragraph which says Doctor, first practice self-care because without self-care you suffer, this is in the oath, the paragraph you suffer from something which is called a compassion fatigue And if a doctor is suffering from compassion fatigue, then they can only treat, they cannot heal. They cannot heal because they are emotionally fatigued. And now this is not just for doctors, this applies to all of us. And more so to every leader who wants to be compassionate and empathize with people. So to be able to do everything that we want to do and this pure intention we have to serve the world, to be able to serve someone, I need to first have the power to, power to give. 
and which means I need to take care of myself. So to be able to be successful and to be inspire others and let them walk with you on the journey, I would love to walk with you on your journey if that journey means you're going to be happy always. But if your journey means stress is normal, anger is normal, fear is normal, then that's not a journey that many people would like to walk with us. Because they're already going through all their pains and issues. They want someone to handhold them who is able to pull them out of their pain, emotional pain. So when we come here together like this, let's make a personal commitment that to be able to do what we want to do and to keep the intention selfless always and selfless means I need nothing in return. Selfless. Let me commit one hour of self-care time. And don't allow my mind to say I don't have time. That's cheating ourselves and cheating people and cheating the purpose with which we are here today when we say, I don't have time. And that's where yoga and meditation comes in. Yoga means changing our lifestyle. Yoga is not about an hour of yoga. Yoga is a way of living. It's a lifestyle. We as a group have the power to not just help people when they lose a passport, help people when they've lost their happiness. Yes? 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 And that's what yoga can do. Yoga is not just about physical yoga, it's about also energizing the soul, the power of the mind. And we can take up this responsibility that we are going to be happy always and radiate that happiness to everyone. So even while we are helping them to look for a passport, when somebody loses their passport, they don't only lose a passport. They also lose. They also lose their peace of mind. So when you are helping them, then you are not just helping them to look for the passport, you are also helping them to first be peaceful and calm. They will find their passport eventually or they have a new one, but what about all the peace that they lose in the process? And it depletes them. So when we are helping somebody, it's not about what we do for them, it's also about who we are. And just being in our presence, they come back to their original nature of peace. And that's leadership. Leadership. And that's possible if we start taking care of ourselves. Simple practices on a daily basis. Experiment with it for three months, and there's no way that you will not experience the result because they're very simple. Let's shift the way our morning begins. And most important is the time the morning begins. Early to bed and early to rise makes a person makes a person healthy, wealthy and wise. So obviously late to bed and late to rise also must be doing something. <laughs> Yes? They gave us only one side, they thought we will understand what it means. They didn't tell us the other part that uh, late to bed and late to rise, what will it do? There are certain things, these are very scientific, they are for our good. When we start playing with nature and we start doing everything that is opposite of what is right to me, I will face the consequences of that. It's not that, yes, I have to sleep six hours, I will sleep my six hours. doesn't matter what time I'm sleeping. No, there's always the right time for everything. And when something is done at the right time, in the right way, it will give the right result. If it's not done at the right time, not done in the right way, then I'm not getting the best out of those six hours of sleep. Today, some of us are sleeping at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. You are actually going to sleep at a time which is the best time to be awake. It's the time of the highest vibration in the environment 
It's the time for the highest creativity power. It's the time for the best intuition. At that time, we go to sleep. So a leader means the one who will wake up at that time because they need their creativity and their intuition. Now is not the time to lead by logic. Now will be the time to lead by intuition because situations are unpredictable. So an experiment, early to bed, early to rise. Medically, you can ask a doctor to explain it all to you. The best time to sleep is 10 to 2. 10 p.m. <laughs> yes, because there are many people who are sleeping at 10 a.m. So. <laughs> yeah, we wake up the whole day, whole night, study the whole night, work the whole night, and then go to sleep in the morning. 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Best sleep. Deep sleep. If I do not sleep, I sleep at 12, I've lost out of two hours of the best time. If I sleep at one, I've lost out of three hours of the best time. So I just need to do it. Decide, because I'm a leader. So I'm a leader, I'm going to choose what is best for me. Only then I'll be able to do the best for others. So early to bed, early to rise. Then now once we are awake early, then the phone is not the first thing we switch on and connect to the world. We spend time with ourselves. It's only when we wake up early that we can integrate an hour for ourselves. If I wake up late, then I don't have time for myself. I'm already connected to the world. First through technology and rest through the work that I need to do. So when I wake up early, I can easily give this one hour to myself. No world news, no television, no phone for an hour. Using this time to take care of the inner world. If we want to serve the outer world, we first energize the inner world in the body. And so one hour of spiritual study, all the words that we talked about who a leader should be, I need to study content of those values every day. It's easy to say empathy. It's easy to say selfless service. But this word I want it to become my personality. For that, I will need to study it and consume content of that every single day. It's like a khurak, it's my nutrition. The diet that I take, that's who I will become. We meet people nowadays who are experiencing fear. Ask them any problem in life, they say nothing. Ask them, do you watch serials and movies of this type? Ah, yes. Please stop watching for three months. Fear will go away. That's how direct the impact of content we consume is on the state of our mind. So one hour in the morning a spiritual study and meditation. Meditate to contemplate on what we've studied and visualize yourself using it throughout the day. So using that morning for study, affirmation and visualization. Preparing ourselves who we are going to be today. All leaders have a diary of what they're going to do today. And so the diary says 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 2. Spirituality says add one more column. How you're going to be today. While you are doing what you are doing throughout the day. So the issue of time management is over. There is no such thing as time management. It's actually all about thoughts management. So that one hour in the morning energizes the soul and gives the soul the power to implement all those values we spoke about in the beginning. Then during the day, a very beautiful practice which I've studied and learned at the Brahma Kumaris and which is magical, to pause for a moment after every hour. We call it traffic control of the mind. Traffic control of the mind. Every 59 minutes, pause for a minute, revise the affirmation we created in the morning. So if I start my today with I am a peaceful being, then I revise that I am a peaceful being every hour and see myself being peaceful while doing everything that I'm doing. So I'm creating an emotional pattern of my way of thinking and being. So every hour, pause for a minute. Give rest to the mind, brain and the body. We've experienced that we could be going through a difference of opinion Two people talking, not coming to a consensus, and suddenly there's our one-minute traffic control, the music. The mind stops, 
pause and when we come back we seem to have found the solution because there's so much clutter we don't pause to look for the solution that one minute gives us that space and then before going to bed again an hour without technology very important for a leader to take care of their mind and then leaders should also allow people working with them to practice the same that while at home you are at home not at work so an hour withdraw from technology and spend that time with yourself sometimes doing just nothing also even doing nothing is a very nice thing if you ask yourself when was the last time you were doing nothing hardly ever and that doesn't give the mind the space then and then 15 20 minutes in the night again to study and again to resolve everything that happened during the day clean the mind meditate and then <coughs> silently put your mind to sleep not fall off to sleep prepare your mind to sleep and during the day what we've studied we will implement implement the most important thing that we need to take care of and share with others is while we are all busy earning money we need to remember that the purpose of our profession is not just to earn money the purpose of our profession is also to earn blessings being every day with so many people interaction after interaction whether it's with people who are working with us or whether it's with people for whom we are working every interaction should earn me blessings so that i have two balances one is my financial balance and one is my balance of blessings money can buy a lot but there are a lot of things which money cannot buy and all that money cannot buy <coughs> blessings get us that so blessings is important for our emotional health so while you're doing everything that you're doing throughout the day just see am i getting blessings for what i'm doing am i getting blessings for how i'm being with people because if i'm earning blessings then that's what i'm radiating to people four energies in hindi it is dhan an man tan wealth food mind body they're all connected if my money is clean which means it's coming with high vibrations of blessings then that money is being used to buy the food of the house if that money has someone's pain in the way i earned it then the food i buy will have the energy of pain and that food is not just for me it's also for my family then the food has a direct impact on the mind of the people who eat it and the mind has a direct impact on the body of the person so these four things have to be taken care of if we want to create a powerful destiny dhan an man ta money food mind and body all need to be high vibration then nothing can stop us from inculcating and implementing all those values we've come up with in the beginning but if the first stage goes wrong which is money then it's difficult to create the right energy at the remaining three stages so yoga is about a yogic lifestyle and which means earn right eat right think right be right live right and then serve right i cannot serve others till i am right in everything that i am doing and that's why like didi shared spirituality is the foundation of a leader at the brahma kumari there's a very beautiful word which we understand and practice it is servant leadership leader who only serves and that's what we've learned from all the didis and the dadis when I mean, even if you lived at sister jayanti at the age of 19 to come to another country and we're talking of 1971 nobody was talking about meditation at that time the way we are talking today to come at the age of 19 this requires tremendous power inner power no resources in the outer world and to today take that organization to 130 countries this is the power of spirituality just the faith in yourself the supreme and just going on with the mission 
to serve selflessly. And when we serve selflessly, the first person who is going to be happy is going to be me, myself. One thing, the sooner we realize, the safer we will be. Happiness is not in what we get. Happiness is all about what we radiate and we give to others. That's the, what we get will only give us comfort, not happiness. So let's start from London and let's take the message to India that our new lifestyle, our new lifestyle is going to be a yogi lifestyle. A yogi lifestyle. Yogi lifestyle means high vibration in everything that we are doing. And that's the need of the hour today. Not any country specific. It's everybody. Not gender, not age, it's not for youth. It's for all of us to lead this yogi lifestyle. So yoga day is not for a day, not for an hour. It's a way of living. And at the Brahma Kumaris we practice Raj Yoga, which is a meditation. A meditation which is all about our sanskars and our way of thinking and can be practiced any day, any time, even while we are working, driving or meeting people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sister Shivani. Uh, thank you for your wonderful thoughts. Also, thank you for reminding me of what the fourth value was. Uh, you kept saying always, and that is essentially the fourth value, which is consistency and repeatability. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm in that very happy state right now. I'm, I'm not in the mood to talk, so I'm just going to let um, the day carry on into the next session, which is um, our founder and chairperson, Sana Marora, who's going to have a conversation with Sister Jayanti and Sister Shivani. Uh, Sanam started Nisau when she was heading the LSE India's society and noticed the troubles faced by Indian students and how underrepresented young Indians were on a national level in the UK. Professionally, she's a strategy consultant who specializes in investment management uh, but supports Nisau uh, on a part time basis, uh, on a voluntary basis. This is something that is quite special about Nisau. We don't charge a penny for our services or the work that we do, and all of us in the team are here on a voluntary basis. To finish off, Sanam has won numerous awards for her services to enhance India-UK relationships. And if I'm not wrong, and I often am, just yesterday she was awarded at the House of Commons. She can tell a bit more about it. Congratulations, Sanam, and over to you to take us through an engaging session with Sister Jandi and Sister Shivam. Very kind, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to have a very engaging session with all of us here because this is a very, very unique moment to have both Sister Shivani and Sister Nandi and Mr. Aurora with us, um, who will introduce you to you shortly and all the special things he does. Um, but here is our moment to ask questions, open questions. Um, Sister Shivani said that there is nothing that's not permissible, thankfully. Um, so just feel free to ask anything you have in mind. I'll start off with what's probably something that I often wonder about. I'm not spiritual, I'm not religious, but I'm not anti-spiritual and I'm not anti-religious. So I don't know what I am. I'm still trying to figure it out. But the one question I always struggle with is, is there a God out there? You know? And I wonder if any of you, Sister Shwani, you, Sister Janti, do you have any thoughts on who is God, what is God? And if it exists, is it planning it might be a root term. I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's a he, I don't know if it's a she, but what is out there? I think I was in a similar position to you when I was around 14 to 18. And I was very fortunate because I then came into um, a situation where I started to study the teachings of the Brahma Kumaris. I was exposed to Hinduism at home but also the teachings of Raj Yoga from my mother. My father was Hindu, and my mother was Hindu background, but Raj Yogi. And I grew up with a Western education and background and Catholicism and Christianity. But they didn't answer my questions. 
neither track was able to satisfy the questions that I had. And coming to the Brahma Kumaris, age 18, I understood that there is such a thing as a soul. The body we know about, soul we know about very little. But I was fortunate that I was able to have the experience of this inner light, which is the being, the soul that shines and has peace and love and truth. And so within the first lesson I had that experience. And the second lesson was about God. And I approached it with an open mind because I didn't know whether I believed or I didn't. But the experience of soul was powerful, that I believed, it was my own understanding and experience. And then what I was hearing is that you don't have to have a mystery or any mysticism attached to the idea of God, but God is also a soul, but the supreme amongst all souls. And as such, God has infinite love and peace and truth and joy and so Sister Shivani was talking about a time when we feel empty and we need to recharge. So the existence of God is to serve benevolence, kindness, love. And so in meditation then, in the awareness of the soul, I connect with that awareness of the supreme, the divine, whatever name you choose, as a being of light. And my thoughts connect me to that source of love and light. It's a very practical experience that you can have very, very quickly. And then it's no more a question or a mystery, but it's your own understanding and experience. Okay, I'm trying to digest that. <laughs> I'm still trying to digest that. In that case, um, what does what does religion mean? And why are there so many different religions in the world? Religion in Hindi word is dharma. Dharam. So let's look at it, the Hindi word. So dharam is one word and karam is the other word. Right? So karam is what we do in our thoughts, words and action. And dharam is how we are supposed to do it. Which means what's my quality, what's my nature. Like, what is the dharam of water? Now, since about 2500 years back, we have had very profound divine souls who came and gave us the knowledge of how to be the right way and do the right way. They were teaching us the ways of living. Yeah, we know all their names. They were teaching us the ways of living. People around them at that time connected to what they were teaching. None of them had come to establish a religion. None of them had come to establish a religion. They had all come to teach us the way of living at a time when we had started getting distracted from who we were, the peaceful, pure, divine soul. And each one had the same message to share. Doesn't everyone share the same message, every religion? What is the message of every religion? What's the message of every religion? Love, peace, what else? Compassion, beautiful, goodness, unity, the world one family. If we talk about God, then each one says God is one points up there and says God is light, God is truth. Just study everyone and you're going to find that there's no difference. There's no difference. And they had not come to establish a religion, they had come to teach us this way of living. People around them, instead of getting connected to the teaching, we got connected to the teacher. You and me, connected to the teaching, we would have been united. Because your teaching, my teaching is same. But if you and me got connected to the teacher, then your teacher and my teacher is different. And because your teacher and my teacher was different, I said you and me are different. 
and then finally under one teacher more teachers and then more teachers and more teachers and we have passed through 2500 years many 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 teachers and we got divided i am a follower of this teacher i am a follower of this teacher now this teacher and this teacher is giving the same knowledge but a little different vocabulary a little different word a little you pray at this time the other one says no you can pray at this time also this one says you eat this this one says you can eat a little different thing just because of those little differences we said i am a follower of this one the other person says no i am a follower of this one so religion which was supposed to unite us religion which was supposed to create a world of harmony because of this one little that religion has become the cause of not just division but we can have wage wars in the name of religion today how can religion be the reason for violence it cannot be something went wrong somewhere and that was only this you and me are different so religion is the dharma the dharma of the soul and the dharma of the soul is peace love compassion so what is spirituality one suggestion don't call yourself i'm not spiritual because you are it's only that maybe we don't understand the meaning of spirituality spirituality means spiritual personality and spiritual is the one who is using the values of peace love compassion do you use that yes so you are spiritual in those moments when i get angry ego hatred and those few moments i'm not spiritual because i'm not using my values so that time those few moments i'm not spiritual but otherwise there's not a single person who's not using the values of peace love and compassion so there's nobody who's not spiritual so why we say spirituality and religion is different because spirituality is only actually connecting us back to our own religion and that's something we all saw when we came at the brahma kumaris that the one who is a hindu like jentiven said family is hindu same for me family is hindu someone came from a muslim background someone came in from a sikh background somebody came from christian different different backgrounds everyone had studied their religion but some of us could not understand what our religion was trying to teach us and when we come in for a spiritual study spirituality is just teaching us what religion was teaching us in a simplified manner nothing different and there's no conversion that i came in as a hindu and i'm something else today i am a hindu my religion remains what it was and but what is that religion it's the family where i was born but religion is supposed to unite us all that we need to do is make our every karma on the basis of our dharm what we have done is dharm is for one hour in the morning so i pray i meditate i go to church i go to the i do what all ever one hour in the morning remaining 23 hours karm business thoda bahut to karna hi padta hai ye to hota hi hai wo to hota hi hai so dharm and karm was not getting integrated when we start doing our every karm based on our dharm the world will change the world will change just use your own qualities your dharm in your every karm and to remember that each one is a soul each one is a soul we are all one family god is one god is one and our religion is religion of peace and love and unity and what we were being taught is all right it's all correct but each one was teaching the same so let's look at our, each other with that consciousness that you and me both of us are pure souls so we will be all united and that's the need of the hour today unity religion has the power to unite all of us religion has the power to change the world dharm dharm of the soul i'll take questions from the audience now just raise your hands and introduce yourselves let's start let's take you in the front Um, hi, my name is Ruchita, um, and I study business. Um, Sister Shivani, you mentioned how um, it's important to stay happy always if you want to be a leader, or whatever uh, value that you believe in. It's important to practice it at all times. 
But a lot of times we also come across the I idea that we are all, as humans, we are very unique in the way we feel, very, very unique in the way we perceive things, the intensity of our emotions, etc. So that, that's what makes us all very, very different, right? So um, if, if there's a lot of times when we're talking about being happy all the time, then it is usually perceived as constant pressure of making yourself feel happy all the time, but you're not self-aware of your own emotions or you're self-aware of your feelings and you're telling yourself, no, you're fine, no, you're fine, even if you're not, right? So um, how, these are two contrasting thoughts. So what are your thoughts on that? Being happy all the time only means the ability to think right and respond right to every situation. Happiness is not some excitement. Happiness means here there's tranquility. It's calm. And that's not a pressure, that's a conscious way of living. Conscious way of living. If we want to get back to being emotionally and mentally healthy, then we will need to learn the art of not being dependent on people and situations for the way we think and feel, but to consciously choose our response. And which means shift from these automatic ways of reacting to situations and saying, they did this, so obviously I had to get disturbed. Obviously I will react. Two, I choose how I will respond. Each one is different, but each one has the power to respond right in every situation. Even if I may have come with some scars of aggression, I may have imbibed some scars of anger from my family and my environment, that's where meditation and spirituality comes in, that we have the ability to change any sanskar. Any sanskar. Irrespective of which zodiac sign you're born under. <laughs> which means no blame game. I am a Leo, so obviously I will be like this. No. Not at all. All this is blame game, allowing us to be a victim and not taking up the responsibility to create the sanskars we are comfortable with. My question is, you said that a leader is someone who always reacts well to his subjects. Like if we go down the pages of history, like there have been leaders like say for instance Alexander, Hitler and many others who were not always very kind to their subjects. So my question is, how do you think they managed to inspire so many, despite their causes and actions, like they did inspire thousands of people. So without being very kind and loving to them, like what was the force in your opinion? Can I also add to that question? This is something a lot of people submitted before. They are asking about the right wing, the rise of the right wing all over the world. And by right wing, I don't mean economic right wing, that's a mere economic feature. I mean polarization in our society, whether it's why is Brexit happening in the land that we're currently sitting in, or why is, why is Trump um, be so successful in the US. So the question is, why are polarizing figures so inspirational to so many people. Pardon? Yeah. There's a season and a time for everything. And within our teachings in the East, we understand that things go through phases, seasons. And so there's a season where there's Satyuk, the age of truth, an age in which there's love and truth that prevails and equality and harmony that exists. And then it changes, the golden age to the silver age to the copper age, the time of division and so on. And the period that we've been in for the last 1,250 years or so is described as Kali Yuga, the Iron Age, the age of death, the age of darkness. And the figures that you talk about are all figures of this period, Kali Yuga, the Iron Age. And if we want to continue that way, that's fine. You can have leaders like the ones you've mentioned. But it's actually now a very interesting period in human history when we're at a transition. And so on the one side, you see huge darkness. And the forces of darkness are partly the right wing, but also many other factors. And so I don't need to give you a list of all the things that are going on that are wrong and a breakdown within society. Um, 
just give you one tiny little example of where we're at. Climate change scientists are now talking about agricultural breakdown. That's going to lead to societal breakdown. That's going to lead to civilization breakdown. These are not my words. I can give you the name of the person who's talked about this. A climate change scientist from Cambridge. So it's a description of Kali Yuga, the dark age, the dark period. But when does the sun rise? At the darkest hour, it's time for the sun to appear. And I can guarantee this sort of audience, young people interested in spirituality, would not have happened 10 years ago. It's happening now. And it's because of the rise of the sun. We are seeing interest in not just vegetarian diet, but veganism. We are seeing an interest in spirituality, in values. We are coming back to the awareness of meditation and mindfulness. All of these things are prevalent in the world today. And the fact that you've given up a beautiful Saturday afternoon to be here in one room, locked together, <laughs> hearing things about spirituality. This is part of that process that's happening, the awakening, the sun that's rising. And so, I'll give you another example. Peter Senge is a person I've worked with for many years. He spoke at a forum, and he said, this is around 1999, and he said the quality of leaders for the 21st century has to be humility and leading by example. Would you have thought of that? A, a world person known throughout the world talking about humility as the quality of a great leader for the 21st century? So it's a new era that's beginning. And this is the message of hope for everyone. So we are not in the dark age anymore. We are coming into that age in which there's light that's shining on the horizon and we are part of that process of awakening. Congratulations. about and we touched upon climate change and environment. I know lots of people here have told, sent in questions about that. Does anyone here want to raise that while we're on the topic? Riddhi? Hello, I'm Riddhi Vishwanathan and I'm from the University of Manchester. So as you can see, one of the big global issues facing us is climate change. And we see, we spoke about leadership before and we see various leaders uh, uh, bringing changes to climate change in their own ways. Some use civil disobedience, some pass petitions, some campaigns, some protests. What, according to you, is the best and the most constructive way to address this issue of climate change and how can young leaders actually uh, make a change? By example, by changing my lifestyle because it's human <coughs> intervention and the consumerism and the materialism that has caused the breakdown of our home, the ecosystem, the planet. And so if we want to sort it out, it's not by planting a few trees, even a few million trees isn't going to make a difference. In fact, climate change scientists would say that we've gone past the tipping points. They said this two years ago already. And so what do we need to do? We need to re-educate reuse, recycle, all of those things are going on, fine, but we need to re-educate. And we need to come back to a lifestyle that Sister Shivani was talking about, a yogic lifestyle. Vegan diet, that's going to make a huge difference. But most of all, simplicity in everything that I think and say and do and wear and walk and move. So, and it's a time in which young activists are on the move. And I think that's great, because I think all of you can make a huge difference. When young people say no more to fossil fuels, when young people say no more to the consumer society that doesn't care and respect nature, nature is sacred. And so to, when I become aware of who I am, 
and the sacredness of my own inner being, then I can see the world as sacred and I don't see the tree just for chopping down and earning some money, but I see it as sacred. And this is what our ancient traditions teach us, that nature is sacred, every form of life is sacred, and so treat it with respect. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your session, and it was very enlightening. Uh, my name is Rajin Kyan. I'm from University of Manchester. I'm studying Master's in Human Resource Management, and a significant proportion of my uh, Master's is on the leadership. So, uh, there are diff different theories and all that we study, but I have a question which I, I am not yet to, uh, able to find answer to it in any of the, even leadership literature or anywhere which is, we talk about uh, something called as success trap, which is about when someone becomes, a, let's say he, he or she was a leader and he, they get successful, then they get trapped into this, uh, it, it's, it's intoxicating, that success is inso intoxicating, it, it's, we need it more and more and more, and especially I'm talking this in terms of a political sphere, where people uh, win elections and to win the next election, uh, no, I, I'm not directing at any part, party, I'm just saying general, across the world. To win the next election, something will be happening and many immoral practices, unethical practices will be indulged in. So, do you, can you suggest anything after becoming successful, how one can not get intoxicated? And this is because we are all probably going to be leader in one way or other way, if not politics, then in other spaces. but. I think this trap can be uh, can capture anyone. So, is there any solution to get out of this trap or not at all actually going into it? What's the definition of success? What's the definition of success? Which means, what is success for me? The most important thing why we are thinking like this is because the world has projected success to us in a very different way. And so pick up any magazine, the most successful man of the year, the most successful woman of the year, is all about people who have achieved. And this didn't start after we came into a career, this started when we were in school also. You know, so who was the most successful student? Who achieved? So somewhere we started focusing on performance and achievement as a measure of success. We did not even focus on the way that achievement, we got that achievement, whether it was clean, right, ethical, nothing. As long as I've achieved more than the others, I was labeled as successful. So when we start believing that this is what is success only because the world started calling me successful when I achieved. Then I always want to be successful. So if I set a goal for my life, I will be successful when I reach that door. So I keep on start walking towards that door thinking that I will be successful when I reach that door. So that stimulation for my mind is I will be successful when I reached that door. Now I've reached the door. Now I will be successful when I reach the next door. And the next. And the other thing which came in the definition of success will be, I will be successful when I reach the next door faster than you. So one is I have to reach the door, only then I will be successful and I will be successful when I reach before you, which means I have to be number one in who I am. These two things are addictive. They are addictive. Because success meant getting respect from people, so I will get respect from people only when I reach the door, one. Two, when I get respect then I am a good person, so said the world. And third, when the world says I'm a good person, then I'm a good person. So my self-esteem also started becoming dependent on public opinion. This is a very vicious cycle. 
very vicious cycle. So one, I'm always in competition with people. Second, I believe that people will believe that I am good only when I achieve the benchmarks which society has set. And second, I will be happy only when people say that I am good, which was taught to me when I was in kindergarten. Guests used to come home and mummies and papas used to say, Gana sunao, apni poetry dikhao. And the world used to say, good bacha, good boy, good girl. And we grew up believing that my self-respect and self-esteem is dependent on getting approval from people. Now all this is addictive. It's never enough. Once I get this much, I want more and more and more and more. Never ending. And then I could be stressed, unhappy, even on antidepressants, but I could be on the magazine cover. I can be. I can be, I can be, but the world will call it successful. So now for me personally it is not about what the world calls successful, but for me to have my own definition of success. Success in Hindi is safalta, safal, safal. Kya aapne apna jeevan safal kiya hai? Safal doesn't mean aapne kya paya hai, kya aapne apna jeevan safal kiya hai. Safal se safalta, safalta is success. Am I utilizing my every moment, my energy in the right way? Safal kiya. Apna samay safal kiya. Which means did you utilize your time the right way? Kya aapne har shwaas safal ki? So the Hindi word is beautiful. So youth leaders means we will change the definition of success and take it to the world. And that success means I'm happy, I'm contented, now I will walk to the door. It's not that I'm not going to set goals and walk towards the door, but I'm not going to be happy when I reach the door. I am happy and I'm going to walk towards the door. And most important, I am not going to race with people in walking towards the door. I will hold their hands and cooperate with them and walk with them to the door. Which means shifting from a culture of competition to cooperation is the need of the hour for the world. Otherwise, we're sitting at work 10 hours and the person sitting next to me is my rival. How can I be happy? How can I be happy? And then when I create a sanskar of competition, I come home and I'm competing with my spouse. And two of them look at the bacha and say, Bacha, who do you love more, mommy or papa? <laughs> yeah? Don't parents ask the children this? The child doesn't know the concept of loving more or less. We teach the child, who do you love more, mommy or papa? And if the child says, Dada Dadi, finished. <laughs> this is how, this is competition. Competition. That you love me more than the other person feels good. This, this is not a very healthy thing. That I am happy if my child says, I love mommy more than papa. This is not a good feeling. But that sanskar of competition that I was living with for eight hours at work doesn't just disappear when I enter home. It's become my sanskar. Sanskar. So if we really want to be successful, then first is we finish, we quit the race. Because there's no race. It's a journey of my karmas. It's a journey of my karmas. And the more I cooperate with people, the more I earn blessings. And the more you earn blessings, you will achieve more than you had ever imagined you could achieve. Blessings is that energy. It's that energy. But for that, I will need to quit the race. And it's a very, it's a, it's just a belief system which the world has created. We are in competition. In fact, we just said life is a competition. So it's over. We're always in the race. A never ending race. I want to be ahead of you and then ahead of you and then ahead of you and then ahead of you. I was talking to an organization who was doing very well with their and they had always been number one in the country in what they were doing. And then they said, but we are stressed. They said, okay, what's the reason of your stress? We have to remain number one. <laughs> Even in students, when we were in school, children who didn't do well used to get stressed. Nowadays, the children who come first get stressed. <laughs> Performance pressure. And then we hypothetically said to this organization, if your target is X, 
and next year you achieve 2x, which means double of what you wanted, will you be happy? Yes. But you will not be number one in the country. Somebody else has got more than 2x. Will you be happy? And they would stare at me exactly like how you are staring. <laughs> Exactly. None of you had a response. You are staring because you are not sure whether to be happy or not happy. Your target was X, you got two X. Be more than happy, no? even if your happiness is dependent on the target. But just not be happy because somebody else got more than two X. Ye hame kabhi khush nahi dega. If I have a problem with other people doing well, it's an issue of concern. पहले हम दूसरों के दुख में दुखी होते थे। आजकल दूसरों के सुख में दुखी हो रहे। इनके पास कैसे आ गया? इनको ये कैसे मिल गया? इसके पास कैसे आ गया? And जब से वो फोन पे सोशल मीडिया सबके हॉलिडेज और सबकी कार्स और सब कुछ दिखाने लग गया, तो I thought I'm the only one who's not got all this, and it's really affected people's self-esteem. People's self-esteem has really got affected because constant comparison with other people. No? Earlier we were just comparing with neighbors and friends. Now we're comparing with the world because of social media. Everyone seems to have a nice spouse except for me. <laughs> yeah, people say that, look at this couple, they are happy, they are happy. They don't even know that that's not social media, is not people's lives. I have met couples, we're talking like this, talking about divorce. Evening, you go on to Facebook page and, <laughs> and I have to say, was this the same couple talking in the morning about divorce? And you look at social media, you will say there's nobody happier than that. So it's a very fake world that we are creating. And we are using that fake world to disturb ourselves because we are in a culture of comparison and competition. So apne jeevan ko safal karo. Safal karo. And then you're truly successful. And then achieve. Contentment, people could have achieved and not be contented. And we meet a lot of people who say, I have this, 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 I have everything. So for a problem, kya hai? there's a vacuum inside. Khali. Okay, ji. That was absolutely beautiful, I must say. And you touched upon this concept of happiness insofar as success is concerned. And I must introduce you to you at this point in detail, Mr. Ramesh Arora. Mr. Ramesh Arora is a big supporter of Nassau and he is more importantly, most importantly, an extremely successful business leader. There are more than 22 hotels that he runs in England. And when we speak of tourism, when we speak of hospitality, Mr. Arora is the name that comes to mind. But I also personally know him through Nassau where he's a big supporter where he just gives and gives selflessly. And my question, Mr. Rora, to you is okay. how do you manage such commercial leadership, such philanthropy, and always being chill at all times, always being really calm, really happy. What is, and I know you're working on a happiness project as well, so could you share some light on, on all of this for us, please? Thank you, much. The simple answer is I'll give all the credit, credit to two people in this room. One is Shwani Ben, and gentlemen, and other candidate to my wife. There is as follows. There is as follows. I have done a lot of research on happiness more than 10 years. There is as follows. There is as follows. I have done a lot of research on happiness more than 10 years ago from Howard University as well as from Shivani Bear. I compared the two together. Right? I found more practical on Shivan Pen Projects of Happiness because it adds lots of organic spirituality, real-time spirituality, which could be implemented into the business. Having implemented that in the business, today, we have a in every aspect, in terms of money, business, reputation, happiness, and dhuai sati mili hai, and 90%, more than 90% of our staff are happy souls. And that has been a big achievement. And for that, I commend Shivani Ben, Janti Ben, and my family. And why my family? Because my family is very supportive of what I do. Right? I get up in the morning at 4.30. Right? No disturbance. I have ample time to work on it. Right? So
So these kind of things, you know, plus at home, if you can achieve happiness at home, bring the same happiness to the business. Karma. You know, you have to do whatsoever karma you do for yourself, you do the same karma for your family, and same karma you do for the business. So you have to also look after the community as well. So giving, giving is a, you know, is a nature. Yeah, unless you give, the more you give, the more God will give you. Isn't it? So we have our hotels at the moment, 22 hotels. We have implemented the happiness programs in our hotels, as per, you know, Brahma Kumaris and Shivani Pence programs. And we have accomplished what we wanted. We want to go to the next level. Our next level is going to be the new hotels will have giving only. Every bedroom you are making a booking, right? Percentage of that revenue will also be given to the charities to support in India. So that will be the next right. level. With the blessings of, you know, Shivani Ben and Jenti Ben, we would like to launch happiness project, you know, happiness movement next year, right, after we have finished the whole projects. We want to take the happiness movement to India. Why to India? India today is 125 number on happiness index. The most spiritual country in the world. What is the reason why the souls in India are not happy? Why we are so behind, right? So we have to generate this over here. So we have a convention next year that we are planning, right? After that, our aim will be to take the happiness movement to India. If all goes well, with all your support, we would like you all to be participant of it. The success is for everybody. Try to understand what was the culture and what is Satyu. You have an opportunity to be part of Satyu. <laughs> the sky is the limit for you. And if you want to give, if you want to donate, I would suggest donate, don't donate any money. If you can donate anger, do it. If you can donate jealousy, do it. If you can donate ego, do it. And you are you will be purified soul yourself. You have, you don't have to go any universities. Tell me which universities in the world teaches you emotional wellness. They will teach you the best of business practices, but no emotional wellness. Today, if you go to the CEO of the bank or anybody, ask them, do you lose temper? They say yes, we do. It's natural. Yeah. Do you have jealousy? Yes, it's natural. Do you have ego? Yes, it's natural. It's nothing natural. It is all within you. It is all your frame of mind. You can be 100% anger free. You can be 100% ego free. And you can be 100% jealousy free. All you need to discover yourself. And try to listen the episodes of Shivani Ban in the morning. Or during the day. Half an hour, one hour, if you listen to the episode, your life will change. Um, we will be wrapping up shortly in a few minutes, but I'd like to open up to some more questions. Lady in the front. Um, Om Shanti. I'm Iknur. I'm studying digital media at Cardiff University. And um, you mentioned that we should not be competitive. And you also mentioned that we should have one hour of techno uh, without technology before we go to sleep and after we wake up in the morning. Now, I've worked as a journalist for five years before this. And in my profession, it's absolutely impossible to not be on your phone because you could get a call at 2 a.m. in the night, you could get a call at 10 p.m., you could get a call at any point of time, and if you don't pick up, you most probably lost your job. So how does one deal with that? How can we let go of technology in a professional world that expects you to constantly be on call? Those unexpected calls are once in a while. Okay, they are daily. They are daily. At least you can take care of the other content that you're consuming on a daily basis from technology. Social media, yes. Social media, media also. But as a journalist, you're exposed to all kinds of content and you can't even miss that content. You will be reporting. exposed and you have to catch up with all the content, but it doesn't mean that you cannot keep 30 minutes for yourself in the morning without that content as the first thing of the morning. You need to catch up with what's happening. So suppose your need of the thing is that you have to catch up with it at 6 o'clock in the morning, then wake up at 5.30. If you have to catch up with it at 5 o'clock, wake up at 4.30. Give yourself that half an hour. 
if you want to be good at what you are doing, use your mind so much, then all the more important to give yourself that time. There's a very beautiful quote I got, everyone needs to meditate for 20 minutes, but if you're busy, then you need to meditate for one hour daily. <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> Which means the more you're going to use your phone, the more you have to charge it, the more you're going to use your mind, the more you need to energize it. Those who are not using their mind more, but using the body more, you know, doing physical work, they don't need to meditate so much. Then what, how do you do that with stress and anxiety and you know, you're barely sleeping for six hours and that means you're letting go on your sleep because you're working all day and how does one do that in such a stress? 30 way? minutes, 30 minutes in the morning. When we begin, we have to take out 30 minutes of that time. You know, it does look like something difficult. But we need to begin it as an experiment. When we start taking out that 30 minutes, it's going to impact the rest of the day. The stress, anxiety is all. So I finish my work faster than what I would finish earlier if I energize myself in the morning. So I shift from I have no time to I have lot of time. And I shift from just being tired and fatigued during the day to being enthusiastic and vibrant and happy during the day. So that itself doesn't allow me to get tired, right? So all that will happen when I take out that half an hour. And then, most important, I will sleep well if my day was good. If I'm stressed and disturbed during the day, I carry that disturbance with me to my sleep. So it's not about how many hours we sleep, it's the state of mind with which we sleep. So if my day is being very calm and peaceful, my night is going to be very beautiful sleep and then I require less number of hours because I get energized faster. So then it goes into a cycle of healthy living. That's yogi lifestyle. Otherwise, I wake up after six hours of sleep and yet I need to sleep more. How many of you feel like sleeping more after the alarm rings? That is the sign. That is the sign that I am sleep deprived. Sleep deprived is the now latest illness. I am sleep deprived. And sleeping pill is the Again, we're going to go towards medication for our natural way of living, sleep. So that's all because of our lifestyle. So we're not going to blame our job, but we will find our ways with the job and the lifestyle. Go on. Okay, Hi, I'm uh, Ranjit Singh Rafa from Gurdara University. Uh, small question, you know, your brain is, or your mind is called a jungle of thoughts. You know, during one day, during that 24 hour gap, you know, I mean, 24 hour of the day, you have millions of thoughts coming to your mind. So how do you channelize the right thought into action? How do you channelize that into, you know, into your life, into your lifestyle and, you know, stay with that? First line, your mind is called the jungle of thoughts. By who? <laughs> by who? By those people who didn't take care of their mind and as a result have created a jungle. <laughs> if you take care of your mind, your mind's not going to be a jungle, it's going to be a beautiful garden. Second, millions of thoughts keep coming to me. Thoughts don't keep coming to me. You know, when we say thoughts keep coming to me, it's as if something is coming from outside and coming to me. I am creating thoughts. Now, if I create the right thought, then the number is less. Just create one thought. She's a wonderful person. After that, the mind will not have anything much to say. So I'm over with one thought. Try the opposite. <laughs> she is fill in the blank. After that, the mind will not stop at one thought. So that's always the done. If the quality is right, the quantity of thoughts is lesser. If you start worrying, it's a negative thought, it will continue. So if the quality is right, the numbers of thoughts will be less. It's when the quality is not right, it's a... Yeah. So we need to only focus on the quality of the thinking, the quantity will be taken care of. That's when it's peace and calm and tranquility because you've created the right thought. To create the right thought, consume the right information. Our emotional diet is what we watch, read, listen. 
what we watch, read, listen, and anybody can experiment this. One month, just take care of what you watch, read, listen, and your thinking will change. Thinking will change. So our emotional diet is what we need to check. And meditation will help you to slow down your thoughts. Just add actually, it's almost one month since the Indian election results came out. And I've been following Twitter like a maniac leading up to the elections. And I and suddenly after the election results came, I almost stopped looking at Twitter as regularly as I was. Certainly not checking it about 20 times a day. Um, and I feel a lot better. So my perhaps my emotional diet has genuinely improved not following the clutter and the, the sort of polarized energies of the world. So I, I would highly recommend only checking Twitter at certain times of the day and not putting notifications on at all. I have one question. I just want to share one thing. I met somebody last week who's written a book called Digital Destiny. The name of the book is Digital Destiny. The person is based here in UK. He was there in India. And he has written very clearly that by the year 2025, if we don't take care now of how we are using technology and digital content, then by the year 2025, it might just overpower our mind and we lose control over ourselves. And he was talking about his own family. He has two little sons. And he said, one day in the week, we are no technology. No technology at all, one day in a week. That's the way he does it with his family. And he said, the first half an hour, my children get very irritated. And they start looking at me and saying, what will we do the whole day? There's nothing to do. Because children of this era don't know what is life without technology. But he says we only have to cross that first half an hour. That's where the withdrawal symptom is there. And he says after half an hour, they find ways to keep themselves occupied. And that's when they come up with the most creative things. So in our own ways, it might not be one complete day of a digital detox, but at least a few minutes, an hour, a day, will keep us safe. Hindi mein kehte hain sadhan aur sadhana. Sadhan ko use karo. Lekin sadhan aapke sadhana ko overpower nahi karte. Use technology but don't become a slave to that technology. Be the controller of your technology. Don't let technology control you because once that happens then your the mind's affected. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Basit. I'm from University so I, I want to ask two questions. So one from Frank is in spiritualism, is in Akash. So he doesn't eat onion and garlic. So I want to ask what, why is question and why is the reason behind it. And I also have a question about mental health, like depression and stuff. So do you think because chronic disease is something you can treat it uh, by like therapies and stuff? So do you think like spiritualism is a way to uh, you know correct it? And also, why don't you implement it in India, like in schools and stuff, so that it can be you know, corrected in the really early stages? So two parts, Samir and Malik, and, uh, <laughs> and spirituality and education. It's a chair in the front next to it. Within our diet, yes, it's true, we don't use eggs even, or fish, but also no onions and garlic because they also are a stimulation for adrenaline. And if you look at um, some nations where there's a lot of use of onions and garlic, they're highly temperamental nations. <laughs> and it's a practical experience. Again, um, this method of challenge of a month, challenge yourself for a month not to have onions and garlic and you'll see the difference it makes and the ability to be able to harness your mind in the right way because when we've lost control we don't realize that our diet also has a huge impact on our mind but that's the factor for onions and garlic and the other the aspect of um, mental health and education and spirituality um, Shivani Benz talked quite a bit about that already but We've got into a state where we allow negativity to overpower us. 
because it's Kali Yuga, it's negativity all around us, but I can choose whether I, sh I should absorb it within myself and let that govern me, or am I going to remedy that and find a way in which to make sure I nourish myself in a spiritual way so that I can protect myself from the negativity that I'm surrounded by, whether it's media or social life or work or whatever it may be. And so if I can educate myself spiritually and use that nourishment for the soul, then yes, there's less likely to be the mental illnesses that have overtaken us. And Shivani Ben referred to it earlier, but it's something that WHO also has told us that the fastest growing illness in the world is now mental ill health. So spirituality definitely combats that. Why so many religions? Uh, and you will be answer that. But my question was do we at all need religion? Because the inherent uh, nature of Sanskrit also, we will be with love and compassion. Uh, because if you are driving a car and a person, you know, if you are hitting a person, the first action or reaction of the driver is to move away and save that person, right? So, why religion do we at all need religion? Like we discussed earlier, it's the dharma of the soul and the power to use that dharma in your every karam. If you're able to use it on your own, then you don't need any help and support from anybody. But if we are living in times where we are saying that stress and all these negative emotions are normal, then we're not using the dharam of the soul in our karam. So what we need is study, like we shared, education, and also collective vibrations of people. Like look at this group. This is a beautiful example of collective energy of people who are thinking on the same lines. So when people come together like this, we are creating collective energy of the same vibration. So if someone comes in and sits here, they will get influenced by the collective energy of this room and that will help them to align their mind with that same vibration. So when we meet together to pray, to meditate, even if my mind is going through a little disturbance, it gets aligned. Any of you have been to Mumbai? Yeah. <laughs> Local trip? <laughs> That's what is collective consciousness. You don't need to get down, you don't need to get up. Just stand where the crowd is. That's, that's what it is. You don't have to make too much effort. It all just happens. They're all together and they will push you up there. And that's really what happens when we come in a gathering where everyone's meditating together. So even if I'm very low and I'm very depleted and I come and sit in a room where 100 people are meditating at that time, the vibration of the room just helps to pull me up. If I was trying to do it alone on that particular day, I may not have been able to do it that day. So that's the support system. That support system is beneficial. At least for me, that's what I feel. That support system is beneficial. Um, Sister Shalaji, you mentioned intuition earlier. Could you elaborate on how one can understand what is their intuition and what is their mind pushing them to make certain decisions? Intuition and their logical mind? So how does one know whether it is their intuition um, that they're hearing and not just the mind and the thoughts? Huh. Intuition is where sometimes your intuition may match your logic. That means the logic mind and the intuitive mind is saying the same thing. And sometimes your intuitive mind could be giving you an answer which is absolutely contradictory to what your logical mind is saying. <laughs> Simple way is you're driving and you reach a point where you want to know whether to turn left or to turn right. We're talking of an era before GPS. Okay, so then we would just stop there and say, I turn left. And then suddenly something inside will say, no, I have a feeling I have to turn right. 
So that's where that logical and that intuitive mind was giving two different answers. When I know it's my intuition, that feeling is so strong that no doubt, no doubt, no confusion. Only one thought and I will feel it. This is the right thought for me, which means this is the right choice and decision. At that time, logic could be saying something else. Even people around me could be saying something else. And I may be alone. I may be alone. But my that thought says this is right for me and I don't create any second thought which is coming contradictory to it. So no fear, no insecurity, no doubt, no confusion. That's when the answer is from your intuition. This intuition will not be based on what you logically see today. So as a business leader or as a leader of whatever work you are doing, leader by position, you have to take very important decisions. If you take a decision based on the current situation, that situation may change next month. But if you just meditate daily and silent your conscious mind and you don't go up to the internet to check for answers for everything, then the intuition is going to give you an answer which is going to be valid five years from today. That's your intuition. And in meditation, if you connect to the Supreme Power, you will experience those answers and touching them. You say, this is it. It doesn't matter what the world is saying. That is tapping to the wisdom within you. Like each one of us is a peaceful soul, Shanti hamari nature hai, Gyan bhi hamari nature hai, which means each of us is a wise soul. But we need to tap into that wisdom on a daily basis. Any power not used, any power not used starts finishing. Remember? When we used to remember birthdays, we used to remember phone numbers, now we don't. Now somebody else does spell checking for us. So we don't need to know spellings. I continue my life with wrong spellings. Now to do three cheese, every email type karo, it completes the line for you. So now I don't need to know English also. We are giving up our powers. And we thought this is good. It's making life comfortable. It's making us weak. So similarly, wisdom and intuition is also a power. The more you use it, the more it will increase. Engineering teaches us to experiment. Don't believe anything till you experiment is what science said. And spirituality says the same thing. Don't believe anything till you experiment and experience. And that's why science and spirituality really go hand in hand. It's absolutely the same. The only difference is in science, when you experiment, you see the result. In spirituality, when you experiment, you feel the result. Science may change tomorrow, experiences don't change. This is my experience, now I can stand alone against the world and say this is right for me. Not for everybody else, but this is right for me because I have experienced it. So that's spirituality, it's an experiment. So maybe the nature of experimentation got used over there. But I believe that what is our education, whether we did engineering or whichever education, it's not only about the knowledge we acquire, it's about the personality that gets created. It's a personality. When we go through any process of education, it's also a personality that gets created. So everything that we go through is always going to be beneficial and is going to be used in what we do. Uh, second thing was, I forgot, <coughs> mindfulness. Mindfulness is means, um, again, the right thinking. You're aware of what your mind is doing. You're not living an automatic way of reacting. Emotional patterns which are just repeating, 
without me consciously choosing my response? Are you mindful of what you are thinking? Like we ask people, are you mindful of what you're speaking and what you're doing? Now, are you mindful of what you are thinking? Means are you aware of what you are thinking and are you choosing the right thought? That's mindfulness. Okay, gentleman at the back. Uh, my name is Amal. Uh, my question is uh, related to something you said in your talk. Uh, emptiness. Uh, emptiness in mathematics means it's very little. In yeah. physics, it's, it's, it's something. Uh, but in spirituality, what is emptiness? And how can you use, uh, if, there is, if there is something in emptiness, how can you use that to lead a good spirituality? Emptiness in spirituality. Uh, what does emptiness mean? Emptiness in thought, emptiness uh, uh, in, in, in a sense of space. We never spoke about emptiness in thoughts. Uh, I was referring to uh, the, time, uh, the time when you said, you know, finding yourself. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, I related to myself as there is uh, this world where everything uh, for me is the materialistic things you see around. Uh, for me, when I sit with the, without those things, it is empty for me. And how do you uh, use, in, in a way, use emptiness in spirituality? And what does emptiness mean in spirituality? I don't think I've understood the question. Uh, did you want to give an answer? Emptiness? Is, is there a concept of emptiness? I'm saying vacuum, that inner vacuum. Right. He's talking about emptiness in a positive sense. That emptiness means when there's nothing happening in the mind, right? It's, this is mind. Huh. This is mind. it's just uh, in a sense that yeah, vacuum could be an explanation uh, for that. What, what, how can you use and what does emptiness really mean in spirituality? I'm not sure whether the mind is ever without a thought. We could reach a stage where we create one thought and hold on to it for a long time or you can create many thoughts in one minute. The more I space out my thoughts, which means I create a thought and there is a pause, I will feel that there is no thought, but actually there's no time when there's no thought. Even in deep sleep, even in deep sleep, which means which is the delta stage of sleeping, the mind thinks, but the Thoughts are very, very, very few, so it will feel as if there is no thought. Similarly, in meditation also, we slow down our pace of thinking, and so there could be a fleeting moment where you could think there's no thought. But it's actually not that there's no thought, it's just that I created one thought, and I held on to that one thought. I did not create second, third, fourth, fifth thought very fast. So it's not that the mind is empty, it's just that it slowed down the thoughts. Mind, the nature of the mind is to think. How do you, how do you talk about, you know, uh, in science, something came out of nothing. So, in spirituality, what is that nothing? I would, I would say, you know, if I rephrase my question, what is that nothing? In spirituality, we understand that I am this conscient being, the energy, which is eternal. Eternal. Not it came out of nothing, it's eternal. In Hindi we say Atma, Ajar, Amar, Avinashi. Ajar, Jalani Sakta, Amar, Marti Nei, Avinashi, Vinash Nei Kar Sakte. Because energy. It's not created, it's not destroyed, it's eternal. So it's not coming out of anything because it was never destroyed, it's not created. It was always there, eternal. Did you know? Okay, one final question. Uh, Namaste ma'am, uh, my name is Abhyasi Sagarwal and uh, I'm a master student in international business. I have a question uh, regarding the spiritual journey of uh, some big businessmen like uh, Steve Jobs. Like uh, people say that uh, he received enlightenment uh, when, he, uh, when he was in India, like he got the idea of Apple when he, uh, when he went to a village in Nainital and uh, he supposedly 
uh, went there to meet a Baba called Neem Karoli Baba and uh, a lot of people like including Hollywood celebs like Julia Roberts and even she is uh, she set up uh, like got spirituality from that Baba so like what is your take on that is it possible to get spirituality in such places like what is your take on this <laughs> Take on what? Like, uh, like, is it possible that, um, like, Steve Jobs went to that particular village? It's called Kechi Gao in uh, near Nainital, and he said he said to have spent uh, more than a month in front of the samadhi of that particular Baba, and uh, like he got the idea of Apple after that. So, how is it possible? Like, why what? not? One, we should never question somebody's experience. It's someone's experience, you know? It's an experience. And whoever has experienced it, that experience is real for them. You, me or anybody has no right to question anybody's experience because that experience is just for that person. And neither of us can go and duplicate that experience. So if we think that we can go there, <laughs> it won't happen for us. We will have a different experience. So experiences cannot be duplicated. Experiences cannot be copied. What could have happened, which is thinking hypothetically, that when he spent his one hour like you're sharing, I don't know the story personally. How much? One month. One month, sorry. When he spent one hour at a samadhi of a saint, which means there were very high energy vibrations over there. And he may not have been the only person. Many people must be going there to the same place and must be also sitting in silence and meditating. So over a period of time, what happens? Very high vibration gets created in that place. Same thing what we said. When we go and sit where there is a high vibration already being created by other people, it's going to start influencing our mind and we will experience our stillness. And when I am able to still my conscious layer of the mind, I, that intuition will get awakened and I'll come up with a brilliant idea. Because uh, I raised this topic because uh, Steve Jobs had even advised Mark Zuckerberg to go there and even he had visited that village. And even uh, like uh, lots of famous actors and actresses, for, like mainly it's filled with foreigners. Though it's an Indian village, most Indians are not aware of it, but foreigners are going there and getting enlightened. <laughs> If it's their experience, it's their experience. Without knowing what their experience was and without experiencing it ourselves, I don't think it's right to talk about somebody else's experience. But over a period of time, vibrations of a place will influence people who go there. You can go to any place where people have been meditating or praying and you will feel peaceful. It's just that if you really spend time there and work on silencing your mind, then there can be a brilliant idea there. Thank you. <laughs> Should we do it right actually, now? Uh, may I just say, foreigners have benefited from us a lot. They have mm -hmm. like, chai tea latte, <laughs> turmeric latte. So I think we should let them benefit a bit. Like Ramesh ji said, India is a rich culture of spirituality. India is. It's Bharat. Bharat is rich in his sanskar, sanskriti, adhyatmika. All that we need is to go back to who we were and start using what we used to use. Even everything that our grandparents used to say, ye karo, ye karo, ye karo, was very scientific. The only thing was they didn't give us the science behind it. They just said, ye karo. And now we've reached a stage, we turn back and say, kyu kare? So we lose it. <laughs> We lose it because we're not taking it. So what we should do is we should understand the reason why they were doing it. And once we have the logic why they were doing it, then we can start practicing it. But it is, yes, Bharat is the country where there's been a lot of tapasya, tyag, sattvikta, and that's where very rich in vibrations. So actually, Ramesh, I don't agree that India is not a happy country. <laughs> Why they must have put it 126 or whatever figure we're saying? Because again, the measurement of happiness may have been based on a lot of other factors. 
because like success is measured by other factors similarly happiness also be measured on a lot of other factors and of course we have population and we have poverty so then in that basis you can put it as 126 but uh, there is a result for it as well uh -huh. i mean do we i agree with you that we have got the country of saints country of you know all goodness we have there's no doubt about it but just take an example if there's a road accident somewhere usme kya hota hai ladai shuru ho jati hai they don't call the police ladai shuru ho jati hai ek dusre ko maar le jate hain gussa ho jata hai har ek ego hai aati hai so this is these are natural things so what we are trying to say is from home level ground level this kind of thing should, should not happen accident can happen anywhere but don't lose that that's applicable for everybody all over the world but more over there than here mm, okay. <laughs> we are not in competition with anybody speaking of happiness and competition i must tell you all know india is one so <laughs> yay <laughs> um, and i must yeah, also uh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. So I must congratulate the team and you are all of us for that. One little thing I also wanted to say was for Delhi government. You have introduced a happiness element in your curriculum recently. In the school also, right? Yeah. So must congratulate Delhi, uh, Mr. Gajewal and Atishi in particular for that. Um, and I think we should look to roll that out if we can. Perhaps the Sushi Market Sushi or other organizations. Maybe we can all petition. Um, we, have a, we have a historic mandate in India right now. The BJP government that's leading us has everything it needs to take us to uh, becoming a real powerhouse. So maybe we should we should use our rights as citizens and responsible citizens to force the government to also focus on things like making us happy and, and getting us out of this bad race that our education curriculum really is, unfortunately. Um, so if all of us think of one thing, let's try and do that. Um, I know Mr. Rora, you have some thank yous to you, so I'll let you do that very quickly. First of all, our thanks to Shivani Ben and Jenti Ben for coming all the way and we are so grateful to you that you are purifying so many souls over here right? and we will try to implement more and more in Lundu. And Sanam Ji. Can I please have a really big round of Thanks goes to Sanam Ji. Sanam, you have done a fantastic job as ever. Any organization from India, they come over here, you look after them everyone. And you can count on our support as always. I also go to Mr. Ashok Verma and Baroness Verma. They are all our peace leader. And thanks goes to Mr. Josh Arora. Mr. and Mrs. Josh Arora and Mr. and Mrs. Roni Arora. Is Josh here? <laughs> and next thanks is to Mr. and Mrs. Dhingra, right? They have also helped us a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Vinayak, Naira, and Namrata, they have done a great job as well. Thank you very much. And thank all of you for coming and getting the spiritual you know power from Shwani Van and taking all the time and I hope I hope it has been beneficial for you. Right? And uh, I would not like to forget one more thing, my wife. <laughs> Please, lastly, but most importantly from my perspective, other than of course all the people we've named, can I please have a round of applause for our team in the South? They have worked from Manchester, Warwick, Birmingham, Scotland, you name it. And that takes, that takes a team who has a little bit of leadership in them to be able to do so. A lot of leadership, not a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much everyone. We'll have a few moments of silence where 
Sister Jane, they will give us an experience of meditation. And we invite you to the Raj Yoga Meditation Centers of the Brahma Kumaris. And it would also be nice if we come together like this as a group one day. Yeah, so you take up that as your next. So let's not meet only once a year, but we need to meet once every month like this. Only then together we'll be able to collectively create an energy which will create a shift in the world. Energies like this should meet more often. Because when energies like this meet, magic begins. So Sister Jayanti and all the other sisters and brothers are there at the center. Please fix a date. Let's have a nice get together at the center. Sattvic Bhujan, without an Ingalik. <laughs> But sattvic, because it's cooked in a very pure meditative life, you have to just have that pojan. It will be very simple, but gives a very nice feeling because the vibrations is what is being taken care of. And we can be together in that environment to take this journey forward. Let's take a moment of silence. Didi will guide us and then we will walk out in silence also. Thank you. Shivani, we sorry, um, we have a little announcement. The brother has to make. Ah, there we go. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, the announcement basically is that th th there are a few apps outside which will help you uh, yeah. with your meditation, etc. Yeah. Oh, they're there. Cards. So, so there are cards like these, which are the, there. So that'll give you the name of the app. You can download it and use it for meditation. You will also receive a blessing card from Sister Shivani. So please uh, make sure that you take that along with. Um, Toli, you said, yes. yeah, uh, which is like a prashad basically, so that will be given as well. Um, and there is also uh, an announcement of an event on Sunday, the 7th July, which is Sister Shivani talking to Christiana Figueres, no, who's a former executive of Sister Jayanti. Sister Jayanti is talking to uh, Christiana Figueres, who's the former executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So if you're keen and interested, you can attend that as well. That's my announcement. Thank you very much. You will be listening with a lot of interest and attention. So, let's take time to reflect on some of the things you've been hearing about and go on that inner journey. I'll speak out my own thoughts and invite you to follow those ideas. I look inside and I see many, many thoughts scattered in many directions but now I understand I am the creator of my own thoughts and so I can select which thoughts I want to create and sustain and I choose the thought of peace and in this awareness just watching my thoughts, the speed of my thoughts begins to slow down and I focus on peace. And I begin to feel how deep, deep within the soul my original state of being, my natural state of being, is peace. This is my original, natural state of being. I am peace. This is who I am. And in this awareness, I become aware of the presence of the divine, the being of light, the source of peace, of love, 
of truth, of joy, of purity. And in this connection, peace reaches the soul, but also extends out to my entire human family. From the source of life, I'm able to fill myself and as I fill myself with the power of love, my neediness finishes. I receive from above and I can become a donor, one who can give to others. in the presence of the being who is the truth. I begin to see the illusion, the falsehoods I've been holding on to, and I can let go and absorb truth within myself. And in this connection, I recharge so that the power of peace, the power of love, and the power of truth awakens within the soul. I hold this awareness and come back to the awareness of the physical domain. But now, recharged with my own inner treasures, to be able to use them in being, in thinking, speaking and doing. Please remain seated as the guests will first go out uh, for the dinner. Thank you very much. Blessing cards and the tuning from Sister Shivani and Sister Jane.